warm welcome to our panel on this Congress Future for All. And we are now today we are talking about the conditions of food production and distribution in a just food system. Uh, my name is Juliana Fehlinger and I'm really happy to be here uh, this afternoon with you and to guide you through this panel. Um, we have really interesting speakers uh, to this afternoon, but unfortunately, uh, Abukara Zamora had uh, quite a lot of uh, technical problems. He wanted to join us from Rome, and uh, we hope that he will uh, come to the panel uh, during the whole session, and then we can discuss with him as well. Then I also really want to welcome uh, Marie Populus. She is uh, at the moment in Berlin, and she's there um, working with the Super Coop, which is a cooperative um, supermarket and is now founded uh, in Berlin. Um, she will tell us about um, which kind of other supermarkets are already, already working and what their uh, idea of a utopian distribution system is. And then I also want to welcome Nora McKeon. Um, she has uh, worked for many years um, with the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, and she now is engaged in the research, and writing, teaching, advocacy uh, around food system, people's movements, and governance issues. And um, she also serves as a technical advisor uh, to the West African Network for Small Scale Producers and also with the IP. Which is a network for uh, research on sustainable food systems. So, very welcome to her as well. Um, and now I see that uh, Abukara is uh, coming back. I will introduce him um, as well. Um, he's a sociologist and act activist in um, a labor union in Italy, in Rome, actually. And since many years, he's fighting for the rights of land workers. Um, he uh, used to be a land worker himself, and he supports um, people, uh, land workers, to improve their uh, living and working con uh, conditions. And he's also fighting against the system of, uh, which is in Italy called Caporalato. I think I pronounce it not quite Italian, but um, he will tell us what the whole system of, how this whole system of exploiting um, um, labor from, from farm workers, especially migrants, how it uh, works. Um, at the beginning now, I also want, I forgot to tell you that there is, of course, an interpretation, uh, inter interpreting to four languages of these panels. We have it in English, uh, three of our, uh, two of our speakers are going to speak in English, and Abu is going to speak in French. So if uh, so you will, um, there will be shared a link in the chat where you can have the different languages. You can just choose whether, which language you need. Um, and we are also glad that we have uh, attendees from all different kinds of uh, countries in Europe. Um, and um, so uh, this is also we are also happy to sh to have the possibility although we cannot meet in leipzig uh, directly and get to know each other there uh, at least we can uh, share this panel on an international level um to today we want to speak about uh, different um sectors of the food system and to see how a utopian and just food system can look like there in the production sector, in the distribution se sector, and also uh, which kind of governance we need. So we are guided by this question of um, how organization look like and how do we get there, um, how is the democratic and participative distribution in the food system organized and what kind of policy do we need in order to enable food sovereignty and a just food system. Um, I want now to start with Marie uh, and a question with her and I will give uh, Abu some more time to organize the technical problems. And so Marie, Marie can you just tell us of, of 
um, the, about the, the Supercorp in Berlin. Uh, what is it really? What, what do you mean by a participatory supermarket? And um, how do you want to change the food system with this supermarket? And just so this more personal question, why are you in, engaged and active in the Supercorp? Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm very thrilled to be here and to have the opportunity to talk about, present uh, Supercorp Berlin. Can I maybe see the presentation now? Or I can also just uh, do without. Great, thank you very much. So let me introduce you shortly to uh, Supercorp Berlin. It's um, a community owned supermarket in the making. Um, but before I get into the details, uh, uh, let's have a look at what is the problem we actually want to solve through cooperation, transparency and uh, participation. So we talk about a broken system. This is nothing new, uh, a broken, um, broken agricultural value chains. So it's typically, typically uh, at the beginning of the, of the chain, farmer, farmers who create most of the value, but just get a little piece. Uh, of it, and while in the middle, intermediaries are capturing most of the value, and at the end of the chain, consumers are wondering where the food um, come from, and they see their food choices being designed and uh, imposed, so to say, by the um, agri-food industry. So there is definitely like a trust issue at the core on the one hand side, and on the other side, these power structures uh, which are very valid in Germany, uh, which has a very concentrated um, um, food system, or let's say vertically integrated, um, allows prices to being pushed downwards and also fueling the low willingness to pay of consumers. So we also see that there is a, an issue about you know, value, valuing food. Um, and this is our... Well, then we thought, you know, let's uh, try to build our little sand um, stone in that by creating um, community supermarkets, uh, which is community owned and that, um, yeah, in which food choices can be trusted and uh, in which responsible consumption is possible, would be possible for all through cooperation, participation and transparency. So the idea is to, we, we want to provide a better access to food, to quality food and access in terms, not only in terms of, of price and society, but also in terms of um, information and transparency. Um, so um, how does that work? Well, before I jump to that, I want to say that we didn't invent the wheels. Wheel, so we're importing a governance system of, uh, from New York originally, uh, from the parts of Food Cup, which has been existing for 40 years now, and today they have 17,000 members, and um, this model has been brought to Paris, and it's mushrooming all over in France, so there is really a network right now, and we're trying to bring that to Berlin, adapting it to uh, the local context, of course. So who we are, are we addressing? Well, we are addressing on the one hand side, people who are looking for a community, they want to be part of the neighborhood and part of the solidarity network, others that are really into uh, environmental and social justice and want to change the system, other that might say, yeah, I'd like to buy regional food, but hey, it's too expensive because it's still a niche, uh, at least here. So, uh, the public is very diverse. And now getting in the core of our model. So basically um, all members are at the same time co-owners, uh, workers and shoppers. So co-owners because they buy a one-time share and it gives them a voice to decide how profits are being reinvested in the structure to also suggest products, workers, because they have to have access to these products to commit to, to work three hours a month. And that way we can save uh, around 70, 75% of the cost and reflect them onto end prices and shoppers will like in any other uh, supermarket, but except that you would have more regional food, a lot of variety and uh, complete transparency on how um, the margin is set and how revenues are being distributed. 
So now talking about our impacts, it's pretty tricky, right? To talk about impacts because uh, we're trying to really tackle social and environmental justice at the same time. Um, so it's uh, the idea will 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 the idea is to really base ourselves on these four building blocks or four mechanisms, which are cooperation, transparency, um, participatory decision making system, and fair prices. So as to foster uh, sustainable consumption, um, so um, um, low processed food, regional and seasonal food, etc., contribute to fur fur supply chain as well as giving a voice to people and uh, what we call bottom up food transformation. So I'm gonna go very quickly um, over this um, where we what we have achieved so far. We, we're team of 20 people, 10 people really engaged, 10 like more on-demand um, team members. And it's been one year and a half that we're working on that uh, model. We've organized a crowdfunding campaign. We, we were a lot in the media. And since last June, we started our little prototype, which is basically for us a way to test some features of the model and to see what kind of reach do we have. So now it's still pretty small because we're also very cautious in the way we communicate. But we, um, yeah, we have a community of 60 people with 105 to 10 people joining each week and um, 160 people that are, um, that already signed up. And we have around 2000 people following us in our newsletter. So the next step, it will, a lot of questions are still open and we'll see how it goes, but the idea is to get interaction very, very soon. Um, I don't spend too much time on, on that right now, but maybe one important point is that we aim in 22 um, or 2023 to have our final supermarket open. And that means um, on a scale of around 1000 square meters, why so big? because the model to work and to really um, be able to provide better access to food at better prices, we need to operate at this scale. Also because people who commit um, to work three hours, they don't want to lose time in shopping in a lot of different places. And that's also one of the main learning that, um, yeah, from the other projects. So I'm coming to an end. So basically scalability, we're not aiming at making this system being really bigger. The idea is to, uh, to grow organically and to see what are cooperation possibilities with, with existing initiatives and especially with already existing small food crops. Uh, 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 small technical issue. I'm sorry for that. Um, so yeah, in terms of scalability, we 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 envision a system in which we would uh, be able to be part of a decentralized network and to create uh, synergy effects with already existing small food crops, which could um, be a way to get um, to emancipate ourselves, let's say, from the main uh, market power structures. So that's the team, and so female only fender team, and some more people, of course, are there. Um, thank you a lot. Thanks a lot for, for your attention, and looking forward to a nice discussion. Maybe before I quit the, the screen, you also asked me, Juliana, about my personal motivation to, to actually uh, create such a project. Um, there are many, but uh, my drive was really, I worked into food production in, on the agricultural side before, and I noticed how, uh, how much I was a bit, I had to deal with a lot of greenwashing around me. And I was like, what does it bring to try to make this, is, this more sustainable if we actually don't change the way we think and we don't tackle the food system from the conception um, perspective. So for me, my very personal, um, uh, incentive was to be able to really put a strategy in place, not only in terms of environmental um, an environmental strategy, but also uh, also tackling the social impacts, and also to be able to to uh, to implement to implement it. That's my very personal 
um, incentive. Yeah, thanks a lot for this introduction to the idea of the super cope and and also for your personal yeah the, the, the motivation because um, I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning because it was a bit chaotic as we started so late. Um, I'm working with La Via Campesina in Austria, so I'm speaking to you from Vienna, and as I'm also part of this uh, farmers movement. Um, we have we see the quite similar problems, and so we there's also an initiative group who is founding um, the quite a similar system, uh, quite similar um, co-op in uh, Vienna, at the, and I'm part of this team at the moment. So I'm really uh, glad to hear that you are already, um, yeah, you have already a shop after one and a half years. I think it's really impressive. Um, to our panel so I want to come with the next question to Nora um, and you work quite on a different level more on, on uh, the, the governance level and um, for many years you've worked with the FAO so the Food and Agriculture Organization but now you're more focusing on the global food governance and rural uh, people's movements and um, also in your book, which is called Food Security Governance, you summarize what we need for a just food system somehow. And um, I think your title, you, like the underline of your title, which is called Empowering Communities, Regulating Cooperation, summarize quite well what we need. And so maybe you can introduce us to this idea of food system governance and so afterwards we can discuss about how this leads us to a utopian just food system. So I give the word to you. Um, you're not unmuted, you're still unmuted, sorry. Sorry, ah, well. can you hear me now? Okay, it's a pleasure to be here th this afternoon with you. Um, so uh, let's let's start uh, by noting that we've heard this about the exciting work that Marie is doing and hopefully we'll be able to hear from Abu at the local level. So why should they care about global food governance? Why should they care about ILO conventions, uh, declarations by the UN on peasants' rights or what this, the Committee on World Food Security has to say about markets? Let me try to answer that question by... Um, sharing with you some of what I've learned in four decades in the food world with one foot in African villages and the other in UN conferences that I've written up in this book to which Juliana uh, just referred, uh, in which the key word is power. And of course, let's start with the superpower of the corporations to which Marie um, alluded when she spoke about the system, the food system in, in Germany. Uh, we've seen an enormous concentration of corporate power in supply chains over the past two decades, thanks to the global rules of the game adopted by complicit governments, uh, such that the recent mega merger, mergers of major corporate agrochemical and seed firms have created a big four that controls about 70% of global agrochemical uh, sales. Regular, uh, whoops, regulatory power also is increasingly shifting from the public sphere to private self-regulation. And the corporations have an enormous capacity to influence how issues are framed and what narratives and evidence are brought to bear, including by buying science. In the same period, however, we've also witnessed the growth of networks of small-scale producers reacting against the impacts of neoliberal policies and corporate power from local to regional up to global level as it became evident that important decisions were being made globally and the movements need to be needed to be present remember that the WTO was uh, created in 1995 
And La Via Campesina was born in 1993, just two years earlier, because they saw what was what was happening. From the beginning, uh, FAO, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, was seen as an alternative space to the UN because as a UN agency, it has more democratic governance and was also more open to social movements. So we saw the beginning of a network of networks of rural people, of producers' organizations around the World Food Summits of 1996. That was when La Via Campesina pronounce the concept food sovereignty for the first time at the global level. And uh, this network was strengthened in 2002 at the second World Food Summit with the creation of an autonomous network for food sovereignty, which built up the global advocacy capacity of this movement to such a degree that they were able to influence uh, the international community's response to the food price crisis of 2007, 2008, that saw food riots taking place in capital cities around the world. What did they fight for? A reform of the UN Committee on World Food Security to make it an inclusive and authoritative global policy forum. Uh, and these are some of the points that the food sovereignty movement, which participated actively in the reform, was able to uh, obtain. Uh, the fact that there is a human rights framework that is adopted for global policy decisions, that priority voice is given to those who are most affected by food insecurity, and at the same time are those who are most active in finding solutions. So. Uh, what difference does it make? We've seen over the past 10 years since the uh, Committee on World Food Security held its first uh, plenary session in 2010 that the CFS is uh, very active as a multinational forum in which governments negotiate agreements having heard the evidence of social actors and can be held accountable because they're the ones who have decided. And this is opposed to a word that maybe some of you have heard of, I think you'll be hearing more and more about it, multi-stakeholderism, which is the recipe that is promoted by the World Economic Forum, the club of the big corporate actors. Um, and their recipe is that of coalitions led by corporate actors with just a sprinkling of other actors selected by the corporations, a couple of governments, some NGOs, academics, a few UN figures. So the corporations control the way problems are defined and also the solutions that are found, which are inevitably based on markets, capital, technology, there's no attention given to the different interests and power imbalances among the actors, like putting chickens and foxes in the same coop. At the same time, the Reformed Committee on World Food Security is proving to be an effective place to defend rights and right holders. Some of you may be familiar with the guidelines to governance of tenure of land that were adopted in 2012 and are now being used by communities and movements around the world to defend their rights to their territories. And the Committee on World Food Security is also proving to be an effective place to challenge dominant narratives, to unveil and defend the reality of food webs and our local food systems. Uh, the policy recommendations that have been adopted in the Committee on World Food Security by all the governments of the world demonstrate that it's small scale producers who are responsible for most investment in agriculture. They're this big blue line in the graph. And also for up to 70% of the food produced in the world. It's not true that it's the big corporations, agribusiness that's producing the food that we eat. 
And so the obvious conclusion is that governments need to support what small scale producers themselves are doing and to promote markets that benefit smallholders and local food systems. This led to uh, further negotiations about markets in the Committee on World Food Security. And as you can see, as is represented in this chart, the, the conclusions of these negotiations adopted in 2016 demonstrated without a doubt that these the kind of markets you see here, the diversified, localized territorial markets like Marie's Super Coop um, uh, are the most important in terms of food security because 80% of the food consumed in the world transits through markets like these, not through uh, in global food supply chains. They never get anywhere near a big supermarket. And these uh, realities that have been demonstrated and un accepted by governments in the Committee on World Food Security are being validated by what we're seeing under COVID-19, where we're seeing how the big global corporate-led uh, supply chains are breaking down because food can't travel all the way around the world. And because the workers who are indispensable, I hope we'll hear about this from Abu, in order to harvest the, the crops in the dominant food system are not allowed to cross frontiers. Whereas on the contrary, it's the locally embedded agroecological family farming, uh, selling produce in territorial markets that are proving to be the not only the just, but also the resilient and the effective uh, food systems of the world. This um, this power of the of, of people of people's evidence in the Committee on World Food Security is becoming so important that there is now uh, an enormous attack against the Committee on World Food Security that has been launched by the UN Secretary General, unfortunately, in partnership with the World Economic Forum. He has uh, decided to call a food system summit in 2021. And the person that he has selected to be the in charge of preparing this summit is none other than the president of the Alliance for a Green Revolution for Africa, AGRA, that some of you may have heard about, which is a, a corporate funded, Bill Gates funded outfit that is pushing um, uh, biotech and green revolution technology um, in, in, in Africa. So this confrontation is taking place right now. I think you'll be hearing more about it in the coming months. What is at stake exactly? On the one hand, it's a question of defending our understanding of what a food system should look like. And for us, it's about connectedness, interaction, territoriality, people at the center. Oops, I think I've gotten lost. Mm. Have I gotten lost? We can. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, I can't see anything. Can you see the slides as well? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Well, then I will just go on. Let's see if. Ah, okay. I'm back, but I can't see the slides. So anyway, this is our understanding of what a food system should look like as against the uh, World Economic Forum's understanding of just stringing beads on a chain from inputs to consumption with markets as the motor and people nowhere to be seen. But it's also uh, a question of defending the public sphere and our decision-making rights as citizens of the world, as against the corporate scenario in which we are cast as consumers, assuming we're allowed to accumulate enough money to participate in the market economy in this world of growing inequalities. So I hope in conclusion that I've convinced you that the battle for good global governance is worth fighting for, for all of us. Thank you. Okay, many, many thanks to you, Nora, and I think you definitely convinced us. Um, but now I, st I want to um, bring us more into discussion about, not on, uh, about 
our vision and our idea of how a utopian uh, food system can look like. Um, and in order, in the whole process of this whole conference, there were, uh, we had an, uh, we made an utopian workshop um, together with many, many people from Germany and, but also um, other countries of Europe. Uh, all people, so we invited people who are working in the food system in a different kind of um, sectors. And there we together discussed our vision of um, how the eating, like the, how we, what are we going to eat, how the agricultural system will look like in 2048. And um, we can share the link um, where we summarize our outcomes with you in the chat. And um, as we are a bit over time now, and I also uh, want to the audience and all of you to give you the, uh, the possibility to ask questions to our two guests. Um, I just skipped this summary because you can also read it out um, in, in, this, um, in this little text. We can offer it in German and English. And I just want now uh, to come back to Ma Marie and um, ask you, um, well, you shared with us quite um, yeah, precisely on how the uh, super coop should look like, but I want to ask you on uh, in this this network of distribution. What is your vision? What is your uh, utopian idea of how the distribution system can look like in the future? For example, in two thousand and forty-eight. So, in uh, like to give us a more uh, a perspective on where, what are we fighting for, in which kind of direction we want to go. Yes, that, that's a good question because distribution is right now also the biggest challenge uh, in terms of logistics, for example, infrastructures that we're facing um, and also in terms of power structures, as I was saying before, given that we are in a very monopolistic setup. Um, so first with the COP, we hope to create a gap for such uh, innovative um, initiatives um, to come up. Um, now, as far as we are concerned, we believe that the, and that's, that's what I was trying to show in the, in the ideas for scalability, right, is rather to develop as a network. So we hope that first, um, there will be a gap in the sense of people coming with new sort of business model to actually transport the goods. Because for now, the, the problem in the regional distribution is that most of the time, smallholders are overtaking the distribution, I mean, the transportation of their own products, which doesn't work, to be honest, because you can't be farmer, set distributor, marketer at the same time. So, uh, and it's not, it's not uh, environment, environmentally uh, friendly. So in the future, I really see, um, you know, on the one hand side, you would have farmers that are sharing, that could organize in cooperatives. I mean, this is nothing new, <laughs> but it's just not happening here in Berlin, Vandenburg, which is also related to the West East Berlin um, divide for sure um and to the wall and on the other side uh on the distribution level to see and this is already happening you know like uh, last mile um uh, initiatives or cooperatives that are um uh, that that are uh, trying to develop alternative um economies to fight against well-known uh, delivery, for example, or well-known logistical uh, logistic options. So I think that's that's one aspect, you know, developing into different decentralized points while being able to develop the distribution and the transportation in an efficient way will be allowed certainly by more efficient um, technologies, but also uh, new governance structures above all. Um, and also maybe on a more demand-driven um, consumption by being able on the consumer side to secure the marketplace for the farmers, 
we can really better we can imagine to better plan you know together and to really um create some more di biodiversity diversity of products biodiversity um diversity of landscapes um yeah Okay, thanks. Um, there's one of our attendees, uh, attendees um, asked also the question that um, you are working on this level of uh, cooperative supermarkets and the dis distribution and he wants or she wants to know um, what are the producers, what producers can do in order to be less dependent uh, on agricultural policies on, on also the subsidy system and I would also want to add also the, the corporation structure and I also want to add to this question I'm coming from Austria where uh, the corporation uh, the cooperative system is really very much abused uh, because uh, there were a lot of corporate uh, cooperatives were founded more than 100 years ago and uh, uh, many farmers deliver to this um, like to, to this co uh, cooperatives, but the price they uh, get for for their products are so low that they hardly can produce. And so those are today those are the big corporations actually those cooperatives that are um, ab abusing their power. And so maybe you can also tell us a bit if you discussed that in the super cope as well. Mm -hmm. So I will start by that. Uh, of course, the cooperatives um, system, as you describe it, it's the same in France. Um, it's the same also in Germany. You, so in France, it's more on um, producer cooperative side that have like milk is always a terrible example. Um, we have the same problem in Germany with, uh, with other types of cooperatives like Hebe, etc. So the cooperative in itself doesn't prevent you, um, doesn't, doesn't prevent such uh, power structure to actually uh, um, take form, but it all depends on how do you, in your status, how do you actually uh, distribute the decision-making power and to which kind of decisions do you give access to, um, to your members and who are your members so you can have a multiplicity of different uh, of, of of different forms of cooperative. I think well, the main point where we do differentiate ourselves from the other ones is that uh, we write down in our stages that we are reinvesting. We're not for profit, so we are reinvesting the profit in the structure. And each year at the general assemblies, um, members can vote on how to 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 reinvest this profit. So for example, at the Parks of Food Cup, they decided they wanted to take part. Okay, now they have money, so they can do crazy stuff like, guys, let's go to Chicago to uh, participate to the next uh, um, demo march, environmental march, right? Um, but yeah, so basically the idea is the more you invest in your own structure, in the end, it's money that is flowing back in, in, in the pocket of your members because the more members you are and the, the, the less costs, success, structural costs you have. And so the, 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 the more affordable you can be for your members. Now, switching to the side of the farmers. So I don't want to touch too much the, the, the political, the, 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 the policy aspects, because for, for, there is one aspect that is sure is that the, the, the policy is not really doing its work right now. And this is why we're coming up with such initiatives in which it feels like, you know, why should consumer like care, of, you know, who is going to find the time to do that? But like there is no other option. So um, what what we are trying to to change for the farmers is to give them the, um, the opportunity to, to uh, define the price together, um, to set the price, pardon, and uh, trying to see, and, and we are still in the process of understanding how to do that, how to share the risks, because in the actual system, you have one wholesaler that is buying to regional farmers 
and um, he's not working with contracts, basically. There is no contract farming happening. So if you're a big farm and you're friend with that guy, I'm exaggerating a bit, um, then you, 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 you're almost sure that you'll be able to always um, provide your products to this, to this wholesaler, right? But for most, or like, let's say for the small holders, um, they never have the guarantee that they will be able to actually uh, sell the products. So we want to offer an independent structure um, or to build this independent structure so as to really work together and, and consider farmers as, as partners. Um, yes. I'm not sure I answered all the questions, but if I didn't, please uh, let well, me know. I I think it's a tricky question and you um, discuss some of the aspects, but I now want to, um, and I think it was also a very interesting picture that this, that the Park Slope Food Corp, for example, is not only investing in their own cooperative, but also investing in, in, the, in the people's movements and going, being part of, of demonstration and see that their uh, project just is a part of a bigger struggle. And I think this connects think, us also, yeah. I, I think the, I, the general idea is to, of our project, our mission is trying to change the relation people have with their food, right? So if actually more people are consuming regional pro products, if we can partner further with initiatives that are helping producers to transition from conventional to organic agriculture, at some point we'll be able to come to a place where uh, the, the Brandenburg uh, agriculture will, will meet the demand uh, it's now experiencing. And so potentially also creating the condition for producers to uh, be less uh, dependent on subsidies. But uh, to be honest, the people I am talking to, they're not the people who are really getting subsidies. And this is why for me, the question is a bit tricky because I, I, I believe there are so many ways in which we could, on the political level, um, create uh, or reward um, farmers, not only for their food production activities, but for their stewardship activities. But this is another, another debate. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I now want to come to Nora. Nora, can you hear us? Because I can't see you at the moment. Yeah, I'm having difficulty with my video with you video, but you can hear us probably. Um, yeah, I can hear you. So maybe you can uh, also share your idea or your vision of how a just food system can look like if you try to think about um, you are in 2048, what, what must change in, in this time and what would be so important to, uh, to, in order to have a just food system? Right. Uh, I, I like to think of this as, as a process. You know, it's great to have utopias. Utopias are absolutely essential because if we don't have a, a vision, a dream of where we want to go, what we would like our society to look like, uh, it's a pretty bleak world. But what is most important is how do we get there? What is the dynamic, the dialectic by which we get there? Uh, there are a lot of, I'm, I'm familiar with a lot of visions that exist at the local level. We've heard from Marie, but also at other levels. But the, the, the big crunch is how do you get there without political will? And political will is not coming from political leaders in this day and age. It has to come from the base. It has to come from strong political mobilization from the base. And I'm sure Abu would agree with me if he, if, if he, if he could talk. So what, what do we do? Undoubtedly, the kind of activity that Maria is involved in is where uh, innovations are, 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 are born. It's where people come together, connect to put into action a different relationship to food, as Marie was saying. But if we don't want to end up with just a lot of um, isolated little localized utopias, what do we do? How do we build up that strength to really make um, a, 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 um, a, a transformation? And that's why I think for me, 
um, the for, for one thing, the idea of convergence is so important. Uh, convergence both among networking, among uh, uh, among activities in in different countries. Marie said that in fact they they got their idea from New York and Paris, and and now Juliana, you're replicating it in Vienna. So that kind of of, of networking, that kind of convergence, but also with convergence with um, other groups and movements that are also engaged in a fight to win back, to regain democracy and to defeat uh, corporate uh, control. And uh, that goes all the way from the, the climate movement, the young people who are out on the street for climate, the Black Lives Matters uh, movement in the US. All of these movements are really fighting the same battle. And we have to find a way to build this strength, to build a common understanding of what the issues are, what it is we're fighting and where we want to go in order to build up this strength. I personally think that we also need to really think out of our Western box. Um, and that means not only being aware of the fact that uh, Germany, the situation in Germany is one thing, the situation in Senegal or uh, someplace else in, in Asia is completely different and we need to be able to contextualize and understand um, these different situations, but also move even farther. Why is it that although we, we respect indigenous people's cosmologies, yet we have so much difficulty taking them on board. What would it mean if Mother Earth were really uh, an actor in, in, in not just something we think about and revere, but really an actor in developing policies for a more just food system? And what do we think about the profound changes that we need to make in our own life scale styles to make this happen worldwide? Um, th these, these are important things. D do we think, I hope I won't uh, start a political, uh, I don't know what, by saying this, but do we think that it's possible to build a just food system under capitalism, particularly the present financialized stage of capitalism, or do we need to think behind that, behind, beyond that and how are we going to get there? Um, so I think all of this is part of, of the dialectic. I personally think, and I agree with Marie, that we need a helping hand from above. We need a, ha a helping hand from food policies. And I would uh, disagree with the person who was suggesting, if I understood correctly, that subsidies are a bad thing. It depends on what you're subsidizing. The subsidies today are subsidizing industrial agriculture and global corporate corporations. But there's nothing wrong with subsidizing agroecological small-scale producers who are producing healthy food uh, for consumers and also uh, contributing to a fight against climate change and to keep the, the ecosystems in, in good shape. So what do we want public policies to do um, and, and how do we ensure that, that it's people who decide the policies and, and not corporations. I see this as a kind of a, a, a dialectic. The, the public policies, the more global level or the national level has to put in place policies that leave more space, that protect the local transformations that are taking place and give them space to converge, to grow, to build their strength. So this is how I see it. It's a dialectic. It's not just a, a utopia and let's hope we'll get there. Um, uh, there are, there's another question from the audience already for you, Nora, and I just wanted to add um, that I understood the question on subsidies more on the, the aspect of dependency from the subsidy because the sub subsidy system at the moment is so frustrating because it's so market orientated and so orientated on the industrial farmers. So I think you don't disagree with each other, but uh, you're talking about different kind of aspects. Uh, I would just want to read out this next question to you, Nora. Um, there's um, Dorothea who asks, I'm struggling with a paradox. Is, is existence of peasants within, cap within capitalism possible or can we expect them to vanish because of competitive uh, pressure? And the other way around, is the existence of peasantry possible in a post-capitalist society despite the fact that peasantry is based on private property and land? 
uh, we can hear you. I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't hear the questions. Your voice broke up when you were. Uh, oh, when you were. Sorry. I'm sorry. The connection isn't fantastic. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so the question is on: um, in, Is small-scale uh, peasant work uh, possible within capitalism, um, or the other way around? Um, is the existence of peasantry um, only possible in a post-capitalist um, society. And you spoke about that already a little, so maybe you can refer to this question and... Um... Yeah, I'd be glad to do so, but I see that we seem to have Abdu, Abu online. And um, I, I wonder, since time is running short, uh, let, let me answer yeah. just very, very, very quickly. I think, I think, uh, of course, you know, using big words like capitalism, there, there's so much to know and to understand. But I think one, one uh, important distinction to make is that the capitalist agriculture, the capitalist system, uh, seeks profits on capital invested and the profits go to the shareholders essentially whereas peasant agriculture for example seeks fair remuneration on work that is done that will allow the reproduction of the family and will keep the environment the land the resources uh, in good condition for future generations so they're very different. Um, uh, peasant agriculture continues to feed the world, even under capitalism, because that's because it's the three billion small scale producers around the world who are indeed producing the food, even though they're suffering enormously under the conditions of capitalism, of corporate control, et cetera, et cetera. So that's that's the the the, the reality. But the very great distinction is between um, uh, seeking returns, profits on uh, on investments for state for for um, shareholders, or seeking fair remunerative prices for work done and for the reproduction of the family and the territory and the community. So these are two very, very different models. Yeah. Thanks, Nora. I think it was important to speak about that. And uh, now we are happy to have you back, Abu, uh, in our panel. Um, can you hear us? I don't know. Abu, il faut que tu 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 uh, tu tu active ton micro. Tu es muet. Non, je j'appuie le micro. Je vais en direct à cause. And for all the English, um, Abu, um, I just want to invite Hello? you to tell us. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, yeah, it's wonderful. It's working. Um, just tell us a little about your work and the work you and okay. The... okay. Maybe you can just tell us a little on, uh, about your work and the struggles for uh, the, the rights of uh, land workers in, in uh, Italy and in Rome and also on the international level. And for all those who are listening to us in German or English, um, we can share the link for the translation one more time and then you can go um, to this link and uh, listen to Abu and uh, to, to the translation of what he's telling us. So I give the word to you. I think it takes some seconds so the translating team Se mi manda il link di prima, uh, ci vado e clicco francese. Sì, l'ho scritto. <sighs> Can uh, the technical team help me what the problem is and if we can speak with Abu?
I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm sorry for those um, problems. It's quite tricky to organize something um, with translation. Okay. Um, I think it's still not working. The translation. Can the technical team support me and tell me if we can speak to Abu if it's not possible? Okay, um, as we um, Abu can speak. You, you can just speak. Um, I think you have to switch on your microphone and um, you can just start to tell us about your work and what you're doing. Okay. You can just speak, Abu. Tu peux commencer? Ok, vous m'entendez? Oui. Oui, ça marche. Okay. Oui, pour la traduction, il n'y a pas de problème. Uh, non, il n'y a pas de problème. Tu peux commencer? Ok. Et bon après-midi à toutes et à tous. Je suis désolé. Il y a toujours des imprévus, ça fait plus du... on est là, je suis là depuis plus d'une heure. Et... Je ne vais pas... Allô, vous m'attendez? Allô? Ok. Donc, bon après-midi, je disais, nous vivons une période particulière, nous vivons un tournant de notre vie signé par plusieurs crises, dont la crise économique, la crise sociale, et aujourd'hui, comme dans une crise sanitaire qui met à nu le dysfonction de, de l'actuel système qui engendre autant d'inégalités, autant d'exploitations et dont affronter aujourd'hui le thème qui est au centre de cette conférence, nous interpelle tous et toutes à une base d'analyse capable de déchiffrer les contradictions auxquelles nous sommes confrontés, dont en particulier quand on parle du secteur agricole et pour ne pas dire comment faire en sorte qu'il y ait des conditions de travail décentes capables d'assurer une alimentation juste et éthiquement saine. J'ai dit que nous sommes dans une phase de crise sanitaire, mais qui a été anticipée par une crise sociale, mais je dirais, j'irai encore plus loin en disant que nous sommes dans une période de 
des crises de la pensée et de la conscience par rapport aux nécessités de notre monde actuel, comme le dit Edgar Morin. Ceci dit que pour espérer voir les travailleurs agricoles, l'ensemble de la classe ouvrière dans le secteur agricole au long le chemin de la chaîne alimentaire, y compris les paysans, les agriculteurs, il nous faut aussi donner des chiffres au niveau quantitatif. Si aujourd'hui, au sein de l'Union européenne, nous avons 22 millions de personnes qui travaillent dans le secteur agricole, cela ne veut pas dire qu'il y a 22 millions de personnes qui arrivent à faire face à leurs besoins vitaux, c'est-à-dire un travail décent, une condition habitative décente, pouvoir faire face aux difficultés de la vie, c'est-à-dire garantir pour soi et pour leur famille une vie meilleure. Et il y a aussi d'autres chiffres qui nous disent que le budget financier au niveau européen de la politique agricole commune sur la période 2014-2020 équivaut à plus de 408 milliards d'euros sur l'ensemble des 28 pays. Alors, l'augmente, quand on voit ces chiffres et on regarde le long de la chaîne alimentaire, avec des travailleurs qui sont contraints à vivre dans des conditions pénibles de travail, au bord de l'esclavage, je ne vais pas dire l'esclavage moderne, mais c'est au bord de l'esclavage. Et quand on voit des ouvriers quand on voit des paysans, des agriculteurs qui sont pliés aux impositions des grandes chaînes, des grandes surfaces alimentaires, ou encore plus quand on observe ce qui se passe dans notre société aujourd'hui, où on voit des travailleurs qui pédalent des vélos d'un bout de nos métropoles à l'autre bout, ce qu'on appelle les riders. C'est des travailleurs des temps modernes, mais qui vivent des conditions de travail archaïques du point de vue de l'exploitation. Et quand on observe tout le long de cette chaîne alimentaire, de ceux qui s'occupent du transport des produits agricoles, à ceux qui s'occupent de la transformation, de la distribution, de la vente, et aussi dans nos supermarchés, ces travailleurs qui sont assis pendant des heures et des heures à la caisse. C'est l'ensemble de cette classe ouvrière qui constitue aujourd'hui l'une des contradictions à l'intérieur de la chaîne alimentaire. Je prends le cas de l'Italie. On a à peu près un million de personnes, de salariés. Mais quand je dis un million, c'est les chiffres du ministère du Travail italien par rapport à la période 2018. 82% de ces travailleurs sont italiens. Et le reste de ces travailleurs proviennent d'autres pays qui n'appartiennent pas à l'espace, pour ne pas dire à l'Union européenne. À l'intérieur de cette catégorie de travail, on a ceux qu'on appelle les invisibles, 
Ce sont des travailleurs qui sont racialisés parce qu'ils subissent le double mécanisme Abou, il faut que tu rallumes ton micro. Tu l'as éteint, je pense, sans faire exprès. J'essaie d'activer, mais ça saute. Vous m'entendez Um, but I, Alors, I, need, I need to ask you to keep it short because we're running out of time. We have only four minutes left for the technical reasons. Ça va maintenant? Oui, oui, ça va. Uh, deux minutes. Okay. Uh, ça marche? Ça marche bien. Je peux y aller? À vous? Oui, oui. De, euh, deux minutes. Euh, il faut que tu... Tu as encore deux minutes pour parler. Et après, il va falloir... Okay. Ton... Donc, je disais, je disais que toute cette situation nous interpelle à nous interroger sur ce qui est aujourd'hui la qualité des produits agricoles que nous consommons. Cela nous interpelle aussi à nous interroger si l'actuelle politique européenne agricole correspond à nos expectatives, c'est-à-dire des conditions de travail décentes, des conditions habitatives décentes. Il y a des travailleurs ici qui n'ont pas, pas accès à l'eau potable ni pour se laver. Il y a des travailleurs travailleurs ici qui commencent à travailler à l'aube, c'est-à-dire de 3 h 4 heures du matin jusqu'au coucher du soleil, 12 heures, voire 13 heures de travail par jour pour un salaire journalier de 20-25 euros. Alors que le contrat, le contrat national prévoit la durée ordinaire de la journée de travail, c'est 6 h 30 minutes pour un salaire journalier qui varie autour des 50 euros. Donc, c'est-à-dire que ces travailleurs travaillent plus de 12 heures de travail et ils perçoivent la moitié de ce qui est prévu par contrat. Alors, ce sont ces produits qui arrivent sur les bancs des supermarchés pour ensuite finir dans nos assiettes. Il y a lieu de s'interroger. La politique européenne commune parle de compétitivité. Alors, cette philosophie du, de la production sans toutefois s'interroger sur la qualité de ce que l'on produit pose un problème. Un troisième facteur regarde le modèle économique à l'intérieur duquel aujourd'hui se développe cette production. Est-ce que l'actuel système économique garantit l'équité, garantit le respect des droits et de la dignité des travailleurs et le dernier élément regarde la question de la nécessité d'une convergence, d'une alliance entre les travailleurs, les paysans, les agriculteurs et aussi les consommateurs. Parce qu'il faut appeler à une responsabilité des citoyens et des citoyennes qui consomment ces produits agricoles. Alors, merci beaucoup à vous, Abou, et je suis vraiment heureux. So thanks a lot to you. Uh, 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 sorry. So thanks a lot to you, Abu. We were just now waiting for the translation to finish, and I think um, you made a really important point also for 
um, our our discussion on uh, how uh, how we can really just transform the food system in, in order to get food sovereignty and uh, just food system now at the end. And I think it's so important to have this solidarity. That's where, why we came together. And we see that also on an international level, it's not so easy also for technical reasons, for reasons of language, but also for a lot of different kind of um, habits to work together, but I think we tried hard in this panel and I'm really happy that we now could at least um, have all of your voices heard. I think all the struggles are so important and a lot of people in the um, audience now ask us um, how they can contact you and um, maybe you can write in the chat an email address so that, that it can be shared in the public chat. Um, just um, for Marie and Nora and Agu, uh, to that we can con that the audience can contact you. I think a lot of people are really impressed what you're doing. So I really want to say a uh, um, warm-hearted thank you to all of you. And I think um, this str struggle also has to con for uh, uh, the struggle for just food system also has to connect with the struggles for all the other things we are discussing in this. Um, future for all um, um, yeah, panels and also the workshops and a lot uh, so thanks also to our audience and of course to the interpreters and the organizing team in the background um, and as I hope we see each other soon also in personal.